Anyway, welcome to everyone. Hello, and a great welcome to not only our new members, uh, we'll mention you by name in a minute, but particularly to our special guest tonight, star of Middlesex England, and your star of Twitch as well. Isn't that right? You Stephen Finn. Confused. <laughs> Stephen Finn. <clears throat> welcome. How are you? And tell us about you, Twitch. You've just, you've just described Twitch like someone who is 95 years old. It's very good. <laughs> well, I am nearly. I've got my bus pass. <laughs> well, go on. Tell no, us I'm, about it. What do you do on I, Twitch? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. Thank you. It's, it's a, a way of streaming your online gaming, which um, makes me sound as though I'm 17 years old, not 31 years old. So it's, it's a way of me clinging on to my youth and trying to retain some youth in my life. So yeah, Twitch and playing playing games and computer games is something that as a professional sportsman seems to be a prerequisite at the moment. So I'm taking part in it. That's part, it's part of where passing the time, isn't it? Simon, you're on Twitch, I know. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm on Twitch. Every, every day of, uh, every week of every month of every year. I'd actually, I think- need to I, watch you on Twitch. <laughs> I think I'm actually more in tune with, um, Finney's father is, is this is right isn't it Stephen yeah yeah show, tell us tell us why because we share a huge affinity for Christmas both of us <laughs> you hate it well I was on test match special in New Zealand I put forward the uh the theory that Christmas would be better off if it was held once every four years like the Olympics and uh, Stephen's dad uh, messaged him to say well that's Simon Mann he, he he knows what he's talking about I agree with him which is a uh, massive <laughs> thumbs up you know, Simon's favourite moment of the year is one minute past midnight <laughs> on Christmas Day. So it couldn't be any further away in terms of the future from a Christmas Day. Such an old Scrooge you are. I'm not giving you ever a present. I'm not going to give you any money, nothing. I'm not, well, you just have to, you have to starve. Well, all right? that's, well, that's why I don't like Christmas, Josh, because you don't give me any presents. Anyway, there we go. Listen, how are you getting on, Finney? What, what are you up to? Um, it must be extremely frustrating for, for players at the moment uh, not being able to train. I mean, you'd love to better train out in the snow and the ice in February, wouldn't you? Well, funny you say that. We actually had an outdoors running session on Monday morning. Uh, and we're at the moment, the way we're training, we're split up into groups of five so that we can all socially distance and stay away from each other whilst we're practicing. And my group of five on Monday morning got the pleasure of running at Merchant Taylor's school on the running track at 9am. So I was literally out in the snow and the ice on Monday morning um, doing some running with my teammates. And yeah, in and around that, we're doing gym work, uh, cricket work and, and stuff at Finchley and Lords, who, which are our two training bases at the moment and flitting between the two of those. But yeah, having the pleasure of being sent outside to run on Monday morning wasn't all that pleasant. <laughs> right, so you're back then. Because we, we've been at the Oval for the, the test match between uh, India and England, and they've got that tent up um, on, on, the, on the Oval outfield. Huge tent. I mean, they can, you know, they can have a circus in there, and there don't look to be any players in there at the moment training, presumably because that's all like in a, in a confined space and no one's allowed to go in there, I, I presume. Yeah, it must be something like that. We actually had a obstacle to our first week of training back after Christmas and it was that uh, travellers had decided that the Finchley car park at uh, the, uh, the indoor school that uh, Yoza will know quite well I'm sure from when he played um, and they decided that that would be a great place to park the caravans and set up for the week so uh, so we couldn't train the first week after Christmas because the travellers had made that their car park and we couldn't get in there they'd barricaded the whole place shut Gee, that's amazing. Do you know, that's really interesting. We, we The Cricketer magazine, um, little plug, it's the 100th uh, anniversary issue in a month's time, actually, which we're just sort of putting together at the moment, But because um, it was founded in 1921. But uh, we shared an office about six months ago, the Lambeth Old Crown Court building with Extinction Rebellion. And that was, in, that was a real experience because they took over the ground floor. It was like, it was like sort of, actually, it was like a sort of mini Glastonbury on the ground floor and we were trying to do work on the first floor anyway listen we'll we'll hear about more about your um your training and everything in, in a in a bit um just to, to welcome some new members uh to to this club perhaps on the back of the beef evening last week uh steve matthew alistair jake thomas chris uh 
um, Harvey, I think that is Harry, P or P or Pi, and another Matthew. Uh, so, you know, thanks a lot for support, supporting us, and particularly for uh, your supporting the Professional Cricketers Trust as well, which is which is great. Um, I just want to tell you one other little thing. Uh, my my field shield is still intact. Um, thank God. And for those who missed this little story, it's because I claimed that India wouldn't make 250 in their final innings in Chennai. I uh, got absolutely abused on Twitter for being an idiot. And I said, if India win this test, I'll bite my shield and take a piece out of it. So hooray, thank God they they played well. And it, Tit Finney was a great test and it must have brought back memories for you of playing in 2012 there, I'd imagine. Yeah, very much so. I think the the one thing that England knew they had to do in the test was score massive first innings runs uh, because first and foremost, psychologically to um, to get to a massive score, I think sometimes even big scores in India aren't enough as England found in Chennai in 2016. I was there for that one. Um, I wasn't playing in the game, thankfully, <laughs> because it ended up being an absolute bloodbath. But um, but yeah, even 470 in that first innings of that test match four years ago wasn't enough. So the fact that they got those massive first innings runs and then as a bowler, when you know that the team has a huge first innings score like that, it allows you to go out and have the freedom to express yourself. And that's what the bowlers did. I thought that in general, they all did a very good job and the icing on the cake was the way that Jimmy bowled on that last day. It was just magnificent. Can, can you can you sort of put put us uh, you know explain how he's managing to do this? Because you know what are you thirty one are you thirty two thirty one thirty one yeah and and I mean you you that's seven years time. Can you see yourself bowling as well as him? I mean bowling as well as you are now effectively. Well. No, <laughs> probably not. I, I plan on doing more of these podcasts and, and virtual cricket much, clubs. Much better for the body, 30, mate. Much better for the body. Exactly, yeah. And being able to drink as much whiskey or whatever I want to do as, as I can. So um, I think the one thing that you notice about Jimmy and every time anyone confronts him about whether he thinks he's on the way out or whether he thinks he's uh, in the twilight of his career, he very determinedly always replies with the answer, why would you think that I'm done yet? I'm still getting better. And I think that it's that attitude of him always wanting to get better and improve himself. And I would say as long as he has that drive and desire, um, like all of us cricketers, really, um, I think you know, if I ever felt like I wasn't trying to get better and I was just stagnating and um, and not trying to get out of the situation that you're in, then I think you'd give up. And I think Jimmy's very much at that stage now where he's enjoying himself, the skills that he's developed um, transcend across the world, and he's able to put those into place as he's showing everyone. Is it possible to get better at, at 38, though? I mean, I mean, he's, he's still bowling. Clearly, he's bowling well. Is it possible to get better, to improve at 38? Um, I suppose the argument is that if you have the attitude to get better and don't feel like you've cracked it, then there's no reason why not. I think with the, I think the, I think him and Stuart have been quite open with the fact that they've not played ODI cricket or white ball cricket since 2015 has aided them in their longevity as cricketers. I think the way that essentially contracted players get looked after in terms of the medical support and the science that comes with that in order to get the best out of someone's body for a long period of time, that's only getting better. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if going into the future, unless you're a real tear away fast bowler, which neither Stuart nor Jimmy are, uh, we'll see players playing for a lot longer now. And actually, I mean, it's backed up by stats that Simon. I don't know if you saw it. Crick Info had a piece today and it showed that Jimmy's average, both at home and abroad, is, is better by far after the age of 30, uh, you know, like radically different. Like I, I he's averaging 32, that. 32, really? You can understand uh, Well, that. I can understand But, but that. you mean not, not but, when you're 38. I, I, mean. I, I suppose I mean from sort of like 35 yeah. onwards, 36 onwards, something yeah. like that. And, and I mean, you know, Finney's answer there was, there's no reason why you shouldn't get better, which I sort of, I agree with, but it's a physical thing in, as well, isn't it? I mean, I, I remember, I, I remember just being sort of thinking I was still, as fit as I was at 33, as I was at 23, but 
number nines were like kind of having a cup of tea and a fag and pulling me for four. Whereas, you know, five years before they were only having the fag before they hit me for four. Um, but, but you've done that joke before, haven't you? Somewhere you, you've done you've done that, and after dinner speech, I, or something. I got fed up with uh, the slip field of just reading newspapers. I was running into bowl when I was thirty three, and I gave up. Uh, but you know, I your body does as you will. I'm sure concur, Finney. I mean, your body does not feel quite the same when you're 31 as it does when you're 21. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And over time, when you do something that's so lopsided and repetitive as bowling, your body adapts and becomes battle hardened, um, sometimes in a bad way. Like I, I'm 31 now. I've had two knee surgeries in the last three years. Um, and it's took me until now, actually, it's only the last few months or so that my body actually feels like it's adapted and has got back to where it was before. For the last couple of years, I've been bowling without a braced front leg. I've been bowling um, with my arm circle, not quite right to try and protect that knee. And that affects you, mm. your form, your confidence and, and everything. And it's only now that once you take a back step back and realize with the help of the sports science team, the physios to strip it back and look at it. It takes you to go back to that drawing board and, and realize that. So, yeah, I think over the course mm. of a career, your, your body does change, but I think it's testament to how fit both Jimmy and Stuart are and the way that they've dealt with their injuries and setbacks along the way is why they're still going now and, and why they're still going so strong. You haven't helped yourself by getting injured batting in the nets. Have you? No, no, I, I don't think it was just solely the batting <laughs> oh, problem. Right, okay. But yeah, that the, there were underlying issues for a, for a little while before that. Um, but yeah, I think to to go home from the Ashes tour in 2017, just picking a ball out of the side netting of a uh, of the net and end up have to go home, have surgery, and and it being a bit of a horror show for a couple of years after that was not quite expected. Yeah. Mm. There's the other thing, Finney, as well. I mean, you're 31, but you, you started your first class career at the age of what, 16, didn't you? Is that, is that right? 16, so that's, yeah. Yes, that's 15 years of that's bowling. That's amazing. Yeah. Is, and that, that's a lot of bowling, isn't it? Uh, you know, over the course of that time, it does punish your body. And also, as well, when you're bowling at 16, 17, we saw this with Pat Cummings, didn't we? When he was, you know, he got into the Australian side very early and he was bowling quickly. I mean, he was bowling, you know, rapid at 17 or whatever, but that must put a strain on on quite a young body, I, I would think. Yeah, I think it does. I also think the relentless nature of international cricket, I think for the over the course of six or seven years with England, I missed maybe two tours, three tours, where I was either left out or, um, or not fit for something. But other than that, you're on every tour. So even if you're not playing every game uh, but you're there on tour I think it's quite an interesting conundrum that we're seeing now that's resulted as people's there more awareness about people's mental health I think I think the biosecure bubbles have made it apparent that it's not possible for people to be on for 12 months a year playing that intensity of cricket and I think that that's something that 10 years ago when I started my international career though those protocols or measures weren't about it was if you're fit and if you're bowling somewhere near what you're capable of then you just you just go you're on that tour so regardless of whether you're playing or whether you're not playing you're still bowling in the nets you're still turning up to a cricket ground every single day and I think that that wears you down over a period of time to a point where either your body or your mind gives up um, and it sort of amalgamates into this train wreck where you either have surgery or you you have to take time out from the game. So it's um, it's an interesting proposition and all the debates that I've seen over the last couple of weeks about people resting and people not happy with the players missing test matches in India because it's such an important series. But I think there's a bigger picture that is looked at now far better than it was 10 years ago. Mm. Actually, you've bowled, I just looked it up, you bowled just under 30,000 balls in first-class cricket and probably you know 5,000 in one day cricket. I happen to know that that means that you've put roughly 20,000 tons through your body, through your lo lower limbs, um, ankles and knees and stuff. And the reason I know that is because I bowled about that number of balls. And it's something to do with, well, I, I did four times my body weight, you're probably more like six times your body weight through your ankle and knee, are you something like that? I, I don't know the numbers, but I just know 
it got to a stage before my knee gave up that it was hurting a majority mm. of the time that I was yeah. bowling. So, so yeah, it, they're decent numbers and, and it is the amalgamation over time of those numbers that just wears on your body, which again, why this conversation started, it makes it amazing and almost flabbergasting that Jimmy is still going so yeah. strong at the age that he is and, and testament to the athlete that he is. I suppose it's partly the fact that he's very, you know, he is very light on his feet, isn't he? Which, which I mean, must help, I suppose. Um, I'm not saying he's you're not heavy huge. on your feet, by the way, but yeah, he's, yeah, he's, no. he's balletic almost, isn't he? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's the incredible thing, actually. I mean, obviously, Jim has been in the Test Match Special Box from time to time doing some, you know, summarising. Mm. And you, you look at him and you feel he could slip through the crack in the door. I mean, he's, he, you know, you think of something like Fred Truman and, you know, also you know, having a big bottom and, like, you know, sort of strong, muscular. I mean, I, I remember Fred, I only met Fred right at the end, you know, when he was obviously, he had put on a lot of weight. So I'm not sure what he was like to sort of be next to when he was, you know, in the 60s or something. But I imagine he was sort of quite... Sort of solid muscular you know jimmy's sort of like that really i mean that, that that's what you really that's what you really notice when you you know you stand next to jimmy or stewart or or whoever the, the, and, and chris wakes as well they're, they're all um they're, they're not as perhaps you might imagine from a from a distance you know that they're not that sort of archetypal fast bowler i mean someone like pat cummings he is sort of you know solid isn't he i i you know that, that's how it seems to me but jimmy's not he's like will of the wisp mm. Yeah, he's lithe, and I think that's definitely helped him. You look at the the way that he runs in. He doesn't have a very long run up. Um, he doesn't particularly over bowl in training, which I think is a problem that a lot of fast bowlers, and especially someone like myself, who is constantly trying to tinker with things to find the perfect match of of pace and control and movement. Um, and you t you spend your time in the nets trying to tinker with that. So that when it comes to the game, you can just concentrate on bowling in the game. But um, but yeah, Jimmy's so confident in his method and comfortable with his method that the, the only real match intensity overs that he bowls or has to bowl are in games. And I think that um, I think that helps him as well. There's a question um, from Jacob. Sorry. Uh, yours, yeah, actually. He's yeah, a sorry, good question. On. I think uh, he said mm. while well, we're talking about Jimmy, he says talk us through the skill of that spell from Jimmy, which broke the back of the. India batting. I presume uh, most people, if not all people, on this uh, tonight on the Virtual Cricket Club tonight have have seen uh, Jimmy Anderson's over. If you haven't seen it, it must be around somewhere. I don't know YouTube or whatever. Um, where he, he, I mean, what was dramatic about, it, of course, was he knocked out two off stumps, which is a, must be a fantastic feeling for a, a quick bowler. Uh, do you want to just take it, take us through it a little bit, uh, Finny? How you saw it? Presumably, you've seen it, have you? You haven't seen it. <laughs> I wasn't up early. <laughs> no, I've seen the pictures and I've seen the balls in isolation. But I've not seen the, right, the whole okay. over or how he set it up. But I think that the skill of what he does, I think, and I think that with reverse swing, it's an interesting topic because I was always in favour of bowling out swing, reverse swing as a bowler with the surprise ball being the in-swinger. So the batsman's always expecting it to leave him and leave your effort ball from, uh, okay. from wherever wide of the crease, but your quick effort ball to be the in-swinger. And that's the method that I tried to um, undergo when I was bowling reverse swing. But Jim's a different style of bowler and he'll assess the wicket or the situation or whatever he thinks. And I think that's one of his great skills is his ability to quickly decipher the information that's in front of him and then to be able to accurately deliver what he says he's going to deliver because we can all run up with the greatest intention of bowling a reverse swinging, in-swinging ball that's going to hit the top of off stump. But actually delivering that is a very much more difficult proposition than, um, than actually talking about it. So, yeah, I think Jimmy's great skill and his most amazing skill is having in his mind a picture of what he wants to deliver and actually delivering it which i think there's many people in the world that can actually do that can you can you just explain to the uninitiated the difference between conventional and reverse and also what its advantages are what is the what are the advantages of reverse swing over conventional swing um conventional swing i'd say is a lot easier to pick um, because it, it's a lot more predictable in the way that it happens. Um, the reverse swing, I would say, fundamentally, things seem to happen quicker and later. I think 
conventional swing can happen from the hand. And when you talk about someone swinging the ball from the hand, it means that the ball is always on a trajectory of either leaving or going into a batsman right from the second it leaves their hand. So therefore, a good player or most players in professional cricket will look at that and see it, be able to read it and then either let it go or play it accordingly. Whereas reverse swing is almost the complete opposite of what you expect to happen. And so reverse swing usually happens in probably the last third of the pitch um, as it gets Mm. closer to the batsman. And that's why you can really make people look stupid when you're bowling reverse swing, because if they misread it from your hand, even just for a split second, it means that they've got such little time to react to what's happening. And that's why when people are bowling reverse swing, you see a lot of the time, especially someone like Jimmy, will run up with the ball in his opposite hand. So the batsman cannot see the differentiation between the rough and the smooth side. Uh, The best batsman in the world will watch your hand from the second you start your run-up to when you release the ball. And they'll be watching so intently to try and work out which way the ball is going to swing that it becomes an advantage for them being able to see it, whereas Jimmy will hold the ball in his opposite hand. So the batsman has no clue or inclination as to which way the ball is going to move until he's in his delivery stride and his load up. And by that stage, it all happens too quick. How easy is it to transfer the ball from one hand to the other? And how do you practice it? Is it one of those things you almost like you close your eyes and you're just practicing it, you know, when you're, I don't know, just sitting on a train or whatever, or just in a car if someone's driving or how, how do you practice that transference well, and getting the ball in exactly the right place? Or is it, is it easy? It depends on whether, where your load up is basically. So excuse me for getting technical and bowling technical That's here. Fine. So fine. if you look at the way that Jimmy loads up he, the ball, it's always on his right shoulder here. So he, he, his elbow points backwards. It's not in front of him, it points backwards. So he's able to take the ball there basically to his right shoulder, collects the ball there where his normal load up would be. And then his normal action starts. I think if you look at people who aren't as natural at it, so someone like myself, I load up back here behind my head almost. Um, and then my arm circles around like that. So if I'm trying to del- get the ball and hide it from the batsman, I've got to take it up there somewhere for my mm. bowling arm to then be on its normal path. So I think he's quite blessed in having an action. And he's obviously honed it over years and years of practice where he can literally simply take the ball in his left hand, simply take it up to there to then deliver the ball. So the way that I tried to counteract that was I, when I was confident or when I am confident, I try and flip the ball as I'm loading the ball up. So a batsman's watching it all the way. And you'll find some fast bowlers, some, some people do this. You, you're running up normally. So a batsman can see the shiny side on this side, rough side on that side. And he's seeing, and he's like, right, okay, this is an away swinger and away swinger. And then just every now and again, I'd flip the ball in my hand and flip it so the shiny side was on the other side. That's, very hard to, that's really hard to do, though. I yeah, mean, incredibly speedy. hard to do. But I've got, yeah, I mean, you know, I've got big hands, so I was able mm. to do it. But, but mm. then it becomes a game, and I find reverse swing is actually a game with the batsman about who can outwit who. It's not a conventional battle between bat and ball. You've got this thing that's so potent if you get it right that um, that it becomes this game with the batsman. So. If you're loading it up, and the batsmen, obviously, when they get used to it, they see you fiddling around with the ball in your hand as you're in your load up, and they're like, right, it's coming the other way. Mm. But then you can, you can fiddle Pretend around. Pretend you're with fiddling it, around and not. Yeah. Exactly. So it becomes, mm. it's quite fun to do. It's and, once you, yeah. and if you're confident and if you're at the top of your game and you're confident in doing that and still being able to deliver what you want to, um, that's why I find <laughs> reverse swing bowling is the most fascinating and, and exciting thing about cricket, full really? stop. Well, um, who, was that guy, real... uh, who, was, who was that guy from Sussex called Navid thing? Navid Rana something. Navid or Hassan. Because he think, was, yeah. I think he did that. Did he move his, change yeah, the position of the but, ball in his hand? But I think he almost did it like when the bat, it was just too late. His skill was mm-hmm. so good that when it's behind his head or something, he flips it. And then all of a sudden, like it's incredible skill. I'm not capable of that. But... Mm. A side caveat to to that is in one day international cricket, again, for me, the most exciting periods of one day international cricket 
rather than the batsman just lashing the ball out of the park for 50 overs, I love seeing bowlers have something to play with. So the mm. way that they've introduced two new balls and now yeah. as a fielding team, you're not allowed to um, throw the ball into the dirt. The ball has to be on the full the whole time to the wicketkeeper. If ever you see a bowler or sorry, a fielder throw the ball into the dirt or onto the wicket, the umpires are always like, keep it up, keep it up because they don't want that ball moving. So it's a spectacle of fours and sixes, which I think wins the art and one of the most fascinating um, periods mm. of play in an ODI is when the ball's reverse swinging. Mm, that's, great. that's great. That's really interesting. Uh, just to say, I mean, um, I totally agree with you about the way that reverse swing happens differently to conventional swing. I mean, I've watched, I've had a look at people like Stark, um, I don't know, Malinga, Wacker Eunice, you know, a few others. I've looked at the, the, the deliveries in quite a slow motion and you can actually see what often happens when they bowl a, say, reverse swing in swinger, it starts to go like that and then it goes in. Whereas, as you say, a conventional in swinger will tend to start and go. Although Jimmy, funnily enough, his, one of the reasons why he's so deadly with his late out swing is because actually the ball starts to go in first. This is conventional and then swings away. But reverse, definitely, the best reverse swing bowlers get the ball to slightly go out and then it comes in. And so the batsman starting to sort of shape. So actually those two wickets that Jimmy took in um, Chennai, both batsmen were sort of pushing out towards the offside and, and, and then the ball came back in. Which kind of opened it opened the it opened the gate in a way, the way the way the the angled ball uh, came down. Yeah, it's a game of deceit, and there's no doubt in my mind. But I'm obviously biased because I'm a a fast mm. bowler. That that reverse swing is uh, you won't see more fascinating passages of play than watching a good bowler bowl reverse swing, mm. and a batsman try and combat it. There's there's no better thing to watch in cricket. Full stop for me. Well, let's let let's enjoy a bit of your conventional swing. Um, just going back to the ashes of 2015, um, I've just got a couple of clips of this test match in at Edgebaston when you took uh, six from one innings, I think, or five first, wasn't it? certainly, wasn't it? Um, there's a couple of wickets here, and you can just enjoy them for a minute. The celebration was like a bit of pent up leaf. Yeah, we don't need to listen to that, Yozum. I didn't, Seven, that's we'll not very well cut by me, that's sorry. That's the quick turn back to Stephen Finn. A call from Johnson, and he's going to be out of court. A back with court, top edge. Finn, the golden arm has done the game, and he's got five wickets. Yeah, it, it was a big wicket in the context of, of the game, so, um, you know, just very happy. So um, tell us about that that performance, because you it was kind of a return. It was a glorious return to the team, actually, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I'd had a couple of years out from cricket and a few trials and tribulations in the time in between that game and my previous game at Trent Bridge in the 2013 Ashes. So, yeah, there's a lot of emotion on that day, a lot of hard work that had gone in in the two years between those two test match appearances. Um, it came back a very, I think, different bowler to the one that I was before uh, in terms of outlook and in terms of the skills that I had at that time. So, yeah, it was um, it was just an emotional comeback and come back into international cricket, I think. But the the one thing that I vividly remember from that test match is just how amazing and loud the crowd was and how when you get on a roll, especially in an Ashes test match, um, I've actually been on two Ashes hat-tricks and never got one. But both times, the, the third hat-trick ball, it never happened. But I've never bowled or played in an atmosphere like when you're being carried in on that hat-trick ball um, and that's one of the most vivid memories that I have of that day. You you found some swing, didn't you? Um, I mean, you weren't never, from what I remember, as an early, you know, as a young bowler, you weren't um, a massive swinger of the ball. But I mean, here, you're actually, I mean, this ball too, is it Michael Clark? I think? This ball here yeah. is an absolute peach. 
Yeah, I mean the the um so when I was younger, when I was really young, I bowled swing and mm. and it was swing from the hand and I was just this tall gangly bean pole pipe cleaner sized bloke who would just bowl these big booming out swingers. Then as I got bigger and stronger, and again, this is an interesting thing about how your action changes over the course of your career just slightly. Um, so what I do you do stronger, differently now then? And more upright. No, it's a, in this period of, of when I first played for England, um, my arm would be beyond the perpendicular almost. It would be upright, but it would be beyond the perpendicular. And it's very hard to swing a ball away from that position. Um, and then... I tinkered with my action a little bit to try and find some away movement um, and then found this happy medium between the two where you're not beyond the perpendicular, but you're just over the top of your front foot. And that year in 2015, I almost found the optimum angle for me to be able to deliver the ball, but still get the ball to leave a right-handed batsman. Um, yeah, there you go. Just I'm over the to top of my it. front foot. Very difficult. I can't stop it at the right place. But um, yeah, I, it, there, there's because it, it, it's not. Is it an easy thing to correct that when you're slightly beyond the perpendicular? You know, how, um, how easy is it to correct that? No, it just takes a lot of it. hard work and a lot of drilling um, the position that you want to get in. And there's no um, there's no other substitute for just repetitively trying to to repeat that position and get into it and practice it. Not everyone was happy with that, uh, Ash's performance in 2015, though, Finney. Alex Gaywood says, um, where, where is it? He said, I had tickets for the fourth day of that test. Thanks very much for finishing off the Aussies in three days, Steve. Well, there we go. You can't, you, can't, right. you can't please everyone. <laughs> I think I was still drunk um, on day four of that <laughs> test match when it came around. So, yeah, the, Sorry about that, but I, um, I'm a big fan of a shortened game. Mm. It makes my life as a fast bowler a lot easier, as long as we're on the winning side, not the losing side. I, I have tried to find, as I told you before, actually, I tried to find some, uh, some footage of the uh, brilliant bowling that you produced in India in 2012 in that Chennai test. Uh, I didn't find that. Alcatan? And I, I assume... Yeah, sorry, Calcutta. I, I assume um, that, that that was reversing that you, when you took those wickets. You got you said you got Coley, I think, and Dhoni. Yeah, Coley was a reverse swinger. Um, I think he nicked it to second slip potentially, but that was just my basic game plan of wanting to a starve him of scoring opportunities because you knew that he liked at that stage to score quickly and get out of the blocks. So. Um, the reverse swing from a round off stump you felt was threatening to him. Um, and then Dhoni was, I think, the last wicket to fall in the innings. And it was that important time where Dhoni could just go berserk and, and get 100 off 10 overs or something stupid like he did to us so many times in one day cricket around that period. So um, I literally had, I, I, I didn't have much left in the tank, but I decided to slam one in halfway down with everything I had. And luckily he gloved it to Graham Swan at Gully. Um, starfished him, as they call it, where he gets the batsman like that. Um, <laughs> so I can say I, I starfished MS Doan India, which which hasn't happened too often. I know a different definition of starfish, but you know maybe we won't go there. Um, so we have uh, past seven, yours. Yes, let's not be on the watershed yet. Um, so, uh, but I, I love the influence that you had in that test match, not just with the ball, but also in the field. And the, what I have found is a, a classic run out uh, achieved by, and I think, well, probably you, I mean, you can explain it, but um, you know, England's sort of total cricket that they played in that period and that ser series, certainly after the first test was sort of almost embodied by, by this incident. Um, so this is the Indians batted first and Saywag and Gambier put on a pretty good partnership and it was looking, you know, fairly ominous. And basically then this happened and we just, we just watch. It's the, I'm sorry about the quality of the pictures here, by the way, but just keep your eye on what happens here. Oh, 
There was a third run and Seva is shocked that there was no response from his partner. And this is just disaster for Seva and for India. So, go on, tell us about that, because that, that was wonderful, actually. Well, I don't think I can really take the credit for that. It was the way that Samit Patel Samit, athletically no, threw himself no, onto you, the floor. You do take the credit for it. And I remember writing about it at the time um, because, you, you know, you, ex, you escorted, uh, you, escort, you, you followed up, you backed up um, Samit there. You know, a lot of bowlers who just, I think you had just bowled an over as well and a lot of yeah, we only played um we only played two seamers that test match yeah so i should have been preserving energy really you should have been preserving energy but instead you were you were chasing around the boundary to support samit and then and then throwing it in when obviously the the throw itself was was fantastic as well so i mean i think you should take some credit for that actually because i thought i always thought i thought at the time that's a great stop by samit but it wouldn't have helped much if you hadn't also chased the ball to the boundary, even though you were never going to get there and be there as a support act. Yeah, fair. I think well, that's one of the reasons or why I think the game is played at a, a very high intensity now. And if you see and you look quite closely, I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't played at incredibly high intensity when you played Yozza, but um, <laughs> I can not imagine Angus Fraser throwing himself onto the floor and, and flinging well, the ball in. Exactly. Um, Ever, even though he walks like he's done it a million times, he, he doesn't. I don't think he did. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things that you just, it's ingrained in your head that if the ball's going to the boundary like that and there's half a chance you might get to it, then you chase it down no matter how hot it is. And that's one of the things that if you watch the guys in their build up for a games in the days before a game, there'll always be fielding drills where two of you are escorting a ball to the boundary or catching a ball and you're always offloading it or throwing it between each other and then throwing the ball in just to practice for that one potential scenario in a game like that. And I also think that Verinda Sewag and Gautam Gambier's running with each mm. other was like watching under nines try and run together. So it, uh, I think that helped me out as well. Yeah, well, you could never, you could never imagine, I, I mean, Tuffers has never escorted somebody else to, to, to the boundary and to help them out to throw it, for instance. And, and and actually, we had the story last week. Beefy actually told the story last week of me being a long leg. And what was I doing, Simon? You were asleep. Now, I, 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 yeah. I, I felt that this didn't quite get the attention it deserved last week. Actually, what we should do is, is very soon go on to um, our, our members' questions. questions. I, I, yeah. uh, and I've got two, two things. So one, actually, before I get on to that is... Jack Jones has made a very good point, and I've noticed that Steve's changed his top. He says, "Got your local New Zealand sheepskin jacket there, Steve." But now you haven't. You've taken it off. It got too hot. Look, I'm, <laughs> I'm sat right next to a radiator. Right. So I've, I put it on just for you, Simon, because I right. thought you might appreciate it. But I did. I yeah. start, sweat started dripping down my <laughs> chest, so I thought I'd better take it off here. <laughs> this is the jacket that Steve had in in New Zealand when he was with us on on TMS, um, and he got an enormous amount of. Uh, stick for it but i mean there were some days it was cold there and it was it was actually very 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 valuable and very useful but yeah, give you, us you, the lowdown on being being blend. being with simon man on tour Vinny. well yeah I, like I obviously had a little bit to do with simon before we went on the tms trip together to new zealand but um yeah it was his excitement at the build up to christmas that really um <laughs> that really caught my eye because it was i think it was late november to or mid-November to mid-December, wasn't it? Something like that. So, yeah, as soon as the Christmas tree started being put up in the small towns that we went to and he was walking around going, oh, bloody Christmas, Christmas, bloody Christmas. Um, that's, when, that's when I realised that him and my dad would get on very, very well. Yeah, well, you blended in very well with your, um, your, sheep, <laughs> your sheep jacket. You, you and about, what, 25 million other... Uh, sheep out there it was a great it was a great <laughs> tour actually it was great it was tremendous fun fantastic the, uh, yeah. some wonderful places yeah brilliant it's great it's, mm. it's, it's i mean there, we do go to some brilliant places um with cricket but new zealand is one of them it's it's, it's a fantastic mm. place to go it's so relaxed and outstanding uh, and now they're number one in the world yeah, and, yeah. In the world test championship as well incredible uh, outstanding cricket team aren't they really i think if you look at it and i tell you what the the most exciting bowler for me in the world at the moment forget Bumrah, forget people like that. I think Kyle Jamieson looks like 
because I watched him quite closely because he's obviously a big fella and we mm. saw him Simon in that warm up game with Fangarai. New Zealand A didn't we at yeah. um, Fangarai. Fangarai. and mm. I remember watching him thinking that this bloke's an absolute monster of a human and he bowled he bowled unbelievably well in that game I think I remember just watching him thinking this bloke's really got something about him um, and yeah and the way he's bowled I think he averages something silly like 13 in test cricket at the moment doesn't he it's like it's got bowling about three, in the five, 1920s. Is... Yeah, like yeah. bowling the 1920s again on cabbage patches. So, um, yeah, mm. they've, they've really found one there to complement Wagner, Bolt mm. and Southie and then their other backup seamers. I think they'll be very, very hard pushed to be beaten in that World Test Championship final when it comes yeah. to it this summer. Yeah. What about Cameron Green, just while we're on tour, emerging fast bowlers? Because he was built up as this... You know, amazing all round that Australia going to just produce, and he didn't take a single wicket in the series against India. Um, sometimes it's the Australian way, but he he looks as though he's got something about him. Yeah, I think when you watch someone, don't you? It doesn't necessarily um, have to be the what comes out of their hand or the end product in terms of wickets or runs or something like that. I think generally you can watch someone and you can tell whether they've got the fundamentals to be a very good player um and yeah you can see the hype around him and and why and i think you look at how valuable those guys are who bat number six and bowl the way that ben stokes has balanced the england team since he's really come into his own skin as a player and the way obviously both them flint off those guys anyone that does both things with a high amount of skill um is an unbelievable cricketer to have so he looks exciting and i've just got one more maybe slightly controversial um, opinion for you uh, is that Jack Callis is the greatest cricketer that's ever played the game ever don't care better than Bradman better than Sobers Jack Callis is the best well you can't argue with the numbers you can't you're quite right and actually I've done a, a statistical analysis of the greatest batsmen that have ever lived um, on based on the one day and so you know, ignoring Bradman really because he was a sort of anomaly. But looking at the batsmen of the last twenty-five years, adding together their Test runs and one-day runs international, to the qualification is fifteen thousand international runs, right? Test and one day. Who's got the best average? Jack Callis. Of so in all formats added together, fifteen thousand runs is a minimum. Qualification. Callis is better than Lara, Tendulkar, De Villiers, Richard, Viv Richards, um, etc. But then, but then he also and then took and then his he's also got two hundred ninety-two wickets. Yeah, he took, yeah, he took three hundred wickets at thirty as well, which for just a normal seam mm. bowler would be an amazing achievement. I think Jimmy Anderson is our greatest ever, and he averages it might be late twenty sixes now, but twenty seven. So. When you add everything together and then you look at the way he caught everything at second slip, he, he's the best cricketer that's ever walked the planet. Fact. Full stop. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. That, those who fans are sobers will probably argue a little bit with that because of his uh, range of skills. But anyway, we're not here to really debate that. Well, I've got one more question, actually, just relating to tall players, though. Um, you know, you're one of the tallest, if not the tallest player that's ever played for England. What... What are the disadvantages? I mean, you can see the advantage of being a tall bowler. What are the disadvantages of being exceptionally tall as a sportsman? I think your, I think injury first and foremost. I think you're you're more susceptible to being injured because your muscles are longer. Um, they're more vulnerable when they're at extreme tension. I think in general, as a tall person, and also you, it's hard to the time that a signal takes to get from your head to the end of your feet or your fingertips can, can take quite a while sometimes. So I think that you can, you can sometimes develop bad habits without really realizing that they're happening. And I know that I've in my bowling career from kneeing the stump to um, finding myself in funny positions when I'm bowling, I think that being tall hasn't aided me in being completely in control of all my limbs that I think that, generally people who are smaller have far better coordination and balance and everything like that. Um, 
I think I've been blessed with quite a number of good physiological things. But yeah, one of the things that I find it very hard to do is to be in complete control of every part of your body. So, so you're actually disabled and you're, at, you're going to sue your parents then in the future. Yeah, maybe. It's, it's all their fault. Yeah, Terry Finn, always fault. Yours, we should get we we should yeah. go on to members questions. I know, but that's that's very but interesting. That's it very is, interesting. It is. Um, I must just ask you because we didn't we didn't get enough on this last week. How on earth did you fall asleep while standing up while fielding for Durham? Um, I was. Uh, we'd had a very late night. Yeah. Uh, as a, as we often did, and I hadn't had much sleep. I'd bowled a few overs. It was a sultry day. Beefy was bowling his military mediums, really sort of you know, trundles. And the keeper stood up, and the, but no one was hitting it off the square. And I thought it's never going to come to me. And for one ball, I shut my eyes. I was so tired, I just closed my eyes at long leg, and woke up to some people shouting "Yozza!" like that. And the ball just hit the rope about a yard to my right. Yeah. Do you think, you're, do, do you think then you're the only cricketer ever fallen asleep on the field? No, uh, loads of people have fallen asleep on the field. I've, you know, the, no, not at all. Okay. Uh, I'm sure loads of loads of them have. Uh, Tuffers was asleep most of the time when he was out at long off or long on or whatever, and the, for the same reasons. Well, he might have been dozing, but actually physically asleep. I suppose oh. he'd fall over. Anyway, all yeah. oh, right. Yeah. Question time now. Come on, yeah, let's question do time. It. So let's. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> quite right. Um, so Rob, Robbie Book. I promised Robbie Book uh, he could have the first question. Uh, now, Robbie is the chairman of the Club Cricket Conference, I think. Isn't that right, Robbie? Uh, if you can connect with us. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Hello. Uh, Steve. Um, we put your camera on if you want. Uh, I thought I had. OK. And maybe Norts isn't doing his job then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, he I, is. I thought I had. Steve, um, um, I've known your family in the background for years in, in Hertfordshire. Um, I was lucky to play against your, your father rather than you on some of the pitches in Hertfordshire, frankly. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, I'm involved at national level uh, with club and amateur cricket. But where would you put your club background in the importance of your career? Yeah, good question. I think that the um the way that i was brought up and the way that i was introduced to cricket was through my father playing and me watching him playing um and, and just being at cricket clubs all the time so i think that that ingrained into me my love for cricket which i'm grateful for because i think cricket clubs probably even more so then than they were than they are now were this great social hub of activity for all the teams on a saturday to come back to the clubhouse afterwards and everyone would um, share stories and things like that, which I think is from just having played a little bit of club cricket in 2020 for Hampstead Cricket Club, um, just around the corner from where I live um, as a build-up for the first class season. You, like, I, I was very fortunate. Hampstead is a club that feels like it has that social hub, but uh, sometimes it felt as though after a game at some of the places that we played, that everyone just disappeared after a game. So, I think that first and foremost, the, my love of the social side of cricket came from that. And then I also think that playing as a kid, because I was um, half decent as a youngster, I got put into men's teams from about the age of 10 or 11 to go and play against men. And I think that when you're playing against boys the whole time, it's a very different game to then go in and playing against some 40-year-old who's been sat in an office all week and he doesn't want some jumped-up little shit of a 14-year-old swinging him around his ears. So he, um, you know, experiences like that taught me how to compete with people who were bigger and better than me at that time. Um, and I think that, you know, me playing club cricket and first-team cricket from the age of about 14 or 15, I think, helped me then go into the professional game as a younger player. Thanks, Steve. If I may, a second. Yeah, thing. go for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my background is uh, in, in club cricket locally as well in Hertfordshire, particularly of Totteridge and Hillians, who uh, I think, Steve, you know very well. Um, and we produce lots of coaches, including, you know, what wonderfully um, uh, your mate, um, Sean O'Brien, who is probably one of the best uh, local coaches. Um, 
despite the fact that we've always spent our time and effort and with celebrity coaches but Sean's come through brilliantly now can you can you advise club cricketers on their potential roles as coaches for our youngsters because that's got to be the future isn't it yeah I think again I think participation in cricket is something that is uh, I think people are trying to address it now but I think for a number of years that participation especially in youth cricket, is something that there's so many other distractions out there for children now. Uh, PlayStation, I mean, I'm 31 and I play PlayStation, so the, the temptation for a 15-year-old to play PlayStation is probably far greater than it is for me. So, um, so yeah, I think it's important that the sociable and the way you can develop yourself as a person outside of cricket are some of the things that should be emphasised to younger people. And I think that... You shouldn't, if you're a cricket coach of, of kids, I don't think you should see yourself as a just a cricket coach. I think that you're some, you should be encouraged to try and help kids in almost every aspect of their life um, in terms of developing people skills, things like that. And I think that, um, yeah, coaches and the people who put their time into making that effort with kids now, I think it's so important um, just because modern life is so crazy now compared to what it would have been when when even I was growing up 15 years ago. Robbie, just to, one other, I've got a question for you, actually. Um, Microsoft have just announced a deal with the ECB. Um, I talked to Tom, Har Tom Harrison about it a bit yesterday, and one of the pillars of this relationship going forwards is using club facilities and, you know, cricket club places as centres of the community to teach people digital skills, uh, to use the Microsoft expertise to basically re-educate or you know, newly educate a community, you know, based around sort of accessing people through club cricket to then help them grow their digital skills and hopefully enhance their lives. Have you have you seen that? And can you can you sort of see what see how that could work? Yes, I can. Um, I'm sorry you can't see me. Uh, the, the, the answer is that there's a huge amount of uh, ability available within the club cricket community te technologically uh, and everything else. The most important part of, of this, what we're talking about, is how we all work within a community situation. And that's where I think from what uh, Microsoft and everybody else can do is to actually ensure that what we have in the future is some kind of an, an ability to get together all of the activity which club cricket can which steve's obviously said three or four times now you, you can get it together in one particular context it's a fantastic ability to do so we have so many clubs there are apparently about three and a half thousand clubs asset clubs in the UK. Beyond that, there are so many of those other people who are able to play cricket, but they can't play cricket necessarily because they don't have the, the grounds to play on. How do we get the technology to actually help them to do it? Um, I'm 100% I'm behind everything that goes with the Microsoft deal. Right, right okay. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, brilliant there. Th thanks for coming on and, and bringing that up. Steve, Finney, you, you missed your vocation, actually, because you could have spent the winters gaming in club cricket grounds, you see, uh, and because they'll all be equipped with, you know, high fidelity stuff. Anyway, let's move on. Catherine, Catherine Goebel's here. Catherine, you, you said all that without moving your lips. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> all that um, stuff that was just coming out. So go on, what's your question anyway? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Hi, Stephen. Um, did you find your participation in The Edge to be quite cathartic and to realise that several of your teammates were equally struggling? And did you, do you think that everything you went through, um, including things like that Bavaria camp, was worth it for an England career? Good question. Um, yeah, the, the Edge was a documentary that I... Um, that, at the beginning when the proposition of opening up about what I experienced at that time was quite a scary thing. I didn't quite understand the scale at which it would end up being um, put out there. So I, I was honest, but I, I probably held a few things back as well that I experienced because I wasn't sure whether it was the platform to, 
talk about it but and and it's also a scary proposition to to be that honest um at the time in a documentary because you're talking about these things that yeah you've talked to i mean i'm quite open about the fact that i've had um help with psychologists and um and professional help with that aspect of things since those times um and still learning to deal with them and live with them every single day which i think is something that has to be and should be talked about a lot more than it even is now um but yeah i think you almost sat there watching it and when i i made a point of watching it, having not seen it before so the first time i had and watched it was in the cinema and i was sat a few people down from trotty i was sat next to ian bell um, and tim bresnan and 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 it felt really really emotional but i also look back at it and think that um you know i i wish i'd realized that these guys were struggling as much as i was at the time because um because you could have talked about it and and you look back at those times and the way that we approached things then um and it's no one's fault it's just the way that things were even seven years ago people's approach and their willingness to talk about that stuff was far less than it is now so it was almost heartbreaking to look back and see how much people were struggling at the time without actually speaking about him um so, and then in answer to the last bit of your question i i think it's made me a better person now having experienced that and i hope that one day that i can help people become better versions of themselves without sounding too deep like in terms of me being a, a mentor or a role model or for young cricketers especially now as a 31 year old playing for middlesex and seeing 17 18 year olds coming through um and trying to help them through that experience um so yeah i i see it as a positive thing for me being able to try and potentially help people in the future yeah catherine do you um do you see the sort of whole mental health thing in the same way as uh, uh it's become a sort of trendy thing and uh, do you think in in your world do people need to talk more about their fears and anxieties and stuff or, or is it well catered for no, I think I think Stephen's right there. Um, particularly in a team environment like that, where you're with each other sort of twenty four seven, to not sort of know what your teammates are going through must make it feel very lonely for that teammate, particularly. Um, so yeah, I think I think saying that it's trendy is possibly the wrong word, but I think the fact mm. that people are talking more will definitely help, just generally. Mm. And uh, Finney, um, you say you know you're it's still still something you're de you're dealing with. I mean, can you give us a little insight into the sort of help that a psychologist can offer you, and and what the, you know what you talk about? Well, I think one of the biggest things about anxiety is that you make a catastrophe out of very small things sometimes, and things that might seem insignificant to a lot of people who don't deal with the um with that aspect of thinking but it's a way that your the way that your brain is wired um that takes you down into these rabbit warrens that you find it very hard to get out of so um i think that the therapy or talking to a psychologist whatever you want to call it allows you to be able to talk yourself into dealing with situations in a far more logical way um and that's just purely by talking about it and being open about it um so so yeah it's it's something that um that i'm still learning to do now i still find myself in situations um and it's not just cricket related it's everyday life where um where you where you, you get that anxiety and it just comes over you and, and you find it very hard to deal with things but yeah talking about it and um and being open about it and almost just accepting that it is a thing now that your mental health is just as important as your physical health and i think that that's something that um that now people are willing to talk about it i think it's um it's something that is a very good thing and and the more people can talk about it or be open about it then it's going to be easier for everyone to deal with it's a great question catherine and um you know by the way 114 applications from professional cricketers last year for help from this charity that we're supporting professional cricketers trust and something like 550 different counseling sessions have been undertaken but the the charity is 
£150,000 down on its usual funding because of the lack of events. And so their chairman or you know, CEO, Ian Thomas, was saying they might have to say to people, look, we can't give you the support that you might want. So all that we're doing here is, is hopefully going, going the right way to help uh, sort of offset that uh, massive increase in demand. Um, Eugene. Hello, Thank Simon. you for coming you along. We've Thank seen you before. Yeah. Thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks for being here. Um, no what's what's your question? Yeah, my question is uh, is I suppose a little bit after uh, cricket, Steve. So obviously seven years left if you're going to go to the same age as Jimmy. But you know what's in the um, what's in the pipeline for you? I spoke to Simo today, and he said that gaming is definitely not going to be in the pipeline. So he said that I should ask you more about like is is media, and more importantly, the podcast you launched on Wednesday. Is that something that you're looking for? Because that hasn't got a shout out as yet but also the work that you're doing with TV and TMS and, and all of that sort of stuff. So what's the aspirations post cricket? Yeah, well, I've not, I've not done much work for TMS since I did that tour with Simon, actually. I think he's uh, he got fed up of me and put, and put in a bad word <laughs> with the BBC to make sure that I don't don't get asked. Yeah, rightly so. <laughs> anyway, we'd love to have you back. You're never available. You're always playing cricket. <laughs> um, no, I think the punditry side of things is something that interests me yeah, uh, because, well, first and foremost, you get to go around and watch cricket in nice parts of the world, which was um, which is lovely and, and very lucky and fortunate to be able to do. But talking about cricket and um, talking in detail about cricket is something that I love doing, as you can probably tell from the way that I've waffled on in certain questions today. Um, but thinking about it in that detail is something that I enjoy doing. Um, the podcast is something that Again, as if we didn't need more podcasts in lockdown. Um, we got the call and got asked if I'd be interested in doing that with Toby Tarrant and Dan Norcross. So, yeah, the first one of those zero ducks given came out yesterday, which was quite exciting and something that I never anticipated that um, I'd be asked to do. Um, and then just trying to diversify what I do a little bit. I've been working on a presentation that um could potentially be taken to corporate companies um, or sports teams about the ups and downs of my career and not just focusing on those particular ups and downs but the methods in which i've or with which i've dealt with those um and and the way that i try that i came through it and come out the other side of that um as hopefully a better person a better human being that's something that I've put together and and um, taking that around potentially to places as well. So, yeah, trying to have my finger in a few pies rather than just uh, just lumping on one. I think I heard the best uh, uh, the best advice ever from Yozza the other day. He said, "Write as many notes as you can right now because you never know when you're going to use them." <laughs> That's good advice. Well, yeah, I mean, no, <laughs> notes. Yeah, and valuable actually because they sort of take you back to where you were when you when you wrote it and gives you the detail. Well, good luck with the with the podcast, and you know you you can't get enough podcasts. Actually, uh, that's not true. You you we need all the ones we can get. I think it's it's great that more players are embarking on it. Um, kind of keep keep it up. It keeps us on our toes, Simon, doesn't it? Yeah, the analyst inside cricket podcast. Um, I would uh, suggest is going to knock that one out of the water. That one that finished. <laughs> no, well, luck. well, no, that's, I I personally think it's great. I like a bit of competition, so. Yeah. Get there, get there, but just keep going. Don't yeah. give up, okay? Yeah, I think that's what people do it for twenty goes, and then go. Oh, that's a bit boring. It only makes me fifty p. Give it a go. Yeah. Try and try and keep it going for a bit, and then we will actually congratulate you, okay? <laughs> yeah, longe longevity. Actually, there's something to be said for it. If you, yeah, yeah. If you, keep keep going. Right. What, what have we got? Right, Robert. Robert. Hello. Good evening. Hiya. How are you? Yeah. Good. Steve. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, injuries had an effect on your England career? Um, yeah, I think there are a couple of times, and I'm not, not just talking about the time where, well, the last time I was involved with England, uh, where I had that knee injury and knee surgery and haven't been seen in an England squad since. I think there were probably a couple of important times in my career where I had an opportunity to stake a, like, stake a claim for a regular spot in the team and, and those being in 2015 when we played Pakistan in the UAE, I think I was in line to be and play that first test match as part of 
a three-man seam attack and got injured a few days before the game with a stress fracture in my foot. And that was something that, looking back now, that was a real opportunity for me to come off the back of a successful summer with that Ashes win in 2015 to then um, stake a claim. And then that same winter in South Africa, I played the first three test matches, bowled well, um, and then tore my side in the on the last day of that third test match uh, at the Wanderers and then missed the fourth one um, and then didn't really have the greatest summer. And then I was out of the team after that. So, um, so yeah, a couple of instances there where I think I was bowling well and I think that I had the opportunity to stake a claim to be a regular in the team and, and it didn't quite happen. Yeah, shame. <laughs> Mm. I'm still I'm still very fortunate. I've played 125 games of cricket for England, which not a lot of people can say that they've done over three formats. So um, and got generally a pretty good record doing it. So I, you know, I look back on times where I'm disappointed, but um, but yeah, I look back on a lot of it with some very favourable memories of series wins and performances that um, that have been pretty decent. So yeah, I'm trying not to be too bitter when I watch Jimmy steaming in for his 900th test wicket in four years time uh, that's a good attitude and actually i think the interesting thing about you is as well is that you've you've done different you've played different roles in test cricket actually because you were sort of an enforcer for a bit and trying to get to 92 miles an hour and you know bowling bounces and things and then you found your uh your outswinger and and you developed that and you know you've had kind of different phases really yeah I, and I think you do develop as a bowler over the course of your career and, and you have to find the best way of dealing with whatever you've got on that day. And, and that's one of the reasons, again, why you look at Jimmy and Stuart and, uh, and the way that they've slightly changed across their career but still remain successful. I think that's an amazing achievement. We've got Thomas Johnston. Now, I think you're a, you're a new member to the club, John Thomas, aren't you? Is that right? Yes, first week. Thanks Great. for having well, me. Where are you? Where are you based? Newcastle, so uh, nearest okay. one's Durham. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Are you, uh, are you a fan of the 100? Will you be watching that? Yes, uh, if it goes ahead. I hope it goes ahead, but uh, it'll be interesting to see if it's uh, any different to the 20, uh, 2020 or mm -hmm. makes a hit here, really. Mm. Okay, well, anyway, great. Thank you very much for joining and uh, tell your friends. And uh, what's your question? Yeah, so I was uh, just looking to understand what do you think is the best over that uh, you bowled when playing for England? Uh, what was, for example, Jimmy Anderson, the other uh, week, his over was seen as probably one of the best he's ever bowled. What was yours? Good question. Um, I think... And I'm going back into the history books here. I played an ODI at Kolkata in 2011. And I bowled Virat Kohli where he left the ball. So he um, it, it just left it and it hit his off stump out of the ground. And it was the build up to that that gave me the most satisfaction, I think. So when I look back at one particular over that I bowled to someone, I think I went past his outside edge, past his outside edge. And I think he was expecting another outswinger and I bowled an in-swinger, and he left it, and it took his off stump out the ground. And I think that is probably the best sequence or series of balls that I delivered in international cricket. Brilliant. Thank you. Pleasure. Everyone says, Stephen, it is a bit of a cliche, oh, it's a great sight for a fast bowler when the poles go flying. Is that the best feeling you can get as a quick bowler to, to knock a batsman's poles out? Depends in which manner it's done. Um, I think, yeah, if you can send one that cartwheels and it just disappears off and almost empowers the keeper, that that is very satisfying, yeah, because it's a sign of how quick you're bowling. But the disappointing thing is, or a, a sort of in-house secret, the only, the reason that a stump cartwheels is because the groundsmen water the holes of the stumps before the days play. So some grounds... And I'm convinced some teams, when your team's bowling, they don't bother watering the stump holes so that when you hit the off stump, it just doesn't go anywhere. But then when their bowlers are bowling, it hits the off stump and it's back to the keeper. Um, so, yeah, so when we play at Lords, I, I try and make sure I'm there a little bit early to make sure that the stump holes are nicely watered <laughs> on my own patch. 
<laughs> what, well, that was your own that, batsman. Yeah, well, home advantage. <laughs> that, I mean, that was the one. The great things about Jim is over. You must, you must have a quick look at it, Finney. Yeah. On, on no, YouTube I will. I've seen it's, it in it's isolation. The, yeah, right. The stumps sort of go like that, and it's it, it and it's it's a fantastic. So it reminded me. I think was it Curly Ambrose did that in his when England got bowled out for forty six. Where was he was doing that to the stumps? He used to, he used to do that, but that was, it was so it was really dramatic cricket. Really, just I'd actually just switched on ten to five in the morning. I, it was eighty eight for two. And I thought, God, my goodness me, they've been playing for they've been playing for about half an hour. They've already scored about fifty runs. Yoz is going to be eating his shield. And then suddenly Jimmy runs in and knocks over two in and over. It was it was a fantastic. I mean, it was unbelievable drama. It was. Moment. It was. Yeah. I mean, actually, you know, it's a good question about um, whether that is the most thrilling experience for a bowler knocking stumps out. And I, I think that the other thing that is really thrilling about a fast fast bowling is just that sheer feeling of running up to bowl on a good day. And, you know, you let go of the ball and it just, it hits the pitch and sort of kisses the pitch and takes off. And even if it doesn't get a wicket, it soars past the edge and goes into the keeper's gloves and the keeper sort of takes it almost sort of knocking him backwards slightly on the shoulder height or going up. And I think that that sensation of you, just you, no, no kind of bat or, or, or bracket or anything. It's just your body producing that venom and that speed and that velocity and the ball climbing into the keeper's gloves and, you know, hitting. I think that's a really satisfying feeling, don't you? Yeah, yeah, completely agree. And, and that sometimes it's the days where you're not actually trying to bowl that quick. And by not trying to bowl quick, I mean, you're relying on your rhythm and the, the good form that you're in to bowl quick. So there's instances where I've tried to bowl quick in international cricket and it's coming up like 82, 83 miles an hour and you're walking back thinking, why am I not bowling quick? I'm really trying today. And then there's the days where you run up and you're not trying to bowl quick and you're just in this groove and this rhythm. You're like almost in this trancey sort of state whilst you're bowling and you look up at the speed gun and it was like 91, 92 miles an hour. Um, and it's those days where you're walking back to your mark and you almost you feel amazing like because you can you're not putting that much effort in mm. um or it feels as though you're not putting that much effort in but the ball's absolutely flying through to the keeper and yeah it's those days that are the most satisfying can fast bowlers get quicker do you think i mean we've we've asked a few of the bowlers on this show actually that question different answers what's your view Depends. If you ask the blokes who played in the 70s and 80s, no one's ever going to bowl quicker than that, ever, ever. Impossible. 100 miles an hour all day, apparently, they tell me, the guys who played in that era. Um, but I, look, cricket cannot be the only sport in the world that has gone backwards. It can't. It can't be the only sport that people bowl quicker 40 years ago than they do now. So I think what we see now is people who are able to bowl quick. And there's no doubt people bowl quick in those days. It's absolutely no doubt. But people's ability to do it over a longer period of time, I think, is only ever going to get better from this point forward. Um, and I look at someone, uh, the most scary prolonged period of fast bowling that I ever witnessed live in my career was Mitchell Johnson in the 13-14 Ashes series. That was just relentless fast bowling for 90 overs of a day and every time he picked the ball up his loosener was like 90 miles an hour and then he just got into his work and and, and that is unbelievable but you look at the physical condition he was in at the time it's no surprise that he was bowling that quick all day because he was in great rhythm and that was paired with being in amazing shape so um so yeah i see no and reason being confident with, as well of course yeah, confidence, the confidence, confidence is a massive because he he was one of those bowlers who actually in that first test in that series in brisbane he didn't get it right to start with and clark took him off and then put him back on and that's when he sort of terrorized carberry and others trotty and people like that but he got confidence from that that spell didn't he and then he it, it yeah. obviously built he built on that well, I had a really interesting conversation with him at the end of that 13-14 Ashes series because by that stage, I was at the bottom of the deepest rabbit warren I'd ever dug for myself and didn't know how to get out of it. And I sought him out in the dressing room at the end of that series where he took he took something like 37 wickets at 17, something stupid, didn't he, um, in that series. And, and I said to him like how did you find your way back from 
um, struggling when you struggled. Uh, not, I can't remember how I quite worded it, but I remember his response. And he was like, mate, I was as nervous as anyone in that first test match. And he got someone caught down the leg side off their glove. I can't remember who it was. Carbs. I think it was, I think it was Carbs, wasn't it? Was it Carberry? Yeah. Um, he got he got carbs out, caught down the leg side off his glove. I think it might have been was, bowling said, round. I think he was bowling round the wicket, actually. Yeah, but yeah, and and he said that that was the moment where I just felt my confidence come back into me, and and it was just a uh, like a period of hard work, and then that little bit of confidence is then what helped him fly for the rest of the series. And how did that did that help you then? And how did that help you? Well, yeah, it, it makes you. I think when you talk to people about their stories and, and how they've come through tough times, I think that that helps you have confidence that you can get out of that tough time yourself. Yeah. So um, at the time I was, I wasn't bowling very well. My action was a mess. I I tried too many things and tried to find too many golden bullets to, um, to try and make myself a better cricketer. And I, and I didn't manage to do that. So, um, so yeah, then, listening to him and the way that he made it sound so simple the methods that he used to get himself out of that find someone you trust he had a fast bowling coach he trusted he went to that person he rebuilt himself he then rebuilt confidence and then went into a game he got that little bit of confidence and then kicked on so yeah it definitely gave me confidence that I could get out of that situation Will you've been waiting patiently and I would like to just say uh, a little Thank you to Will. In fact, we'll give him a round of applause because um, he uh, he very, very generously bought that beefy signed portrait and I've just been around to deliver it to him. And... Yes, I was going to say, Simon, I, I only saw you about an hour ago. So, um, <laughs> uh, hello so, so thank you so much. And uh, uh, nice honestly. to see your dad has a has a copy, a, a very well-thumbed copy of a lot of Hard Yakka as well. <laughs> so uh, you've got good taste, your family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, it's what I could do for the club, um, really. So, you know, thank thank you very much. Um, it's actually about a really up, actually. After you left, we actually thought, right, what, right, where do we put this? So uh, it's... <laughs> you haven't got up. it up yet. No, yeah, it's going to take a bit of rearranging of, of stuff. Yeah, OK, um, good. Hi there, Stephen. Right, you've got um, a question for Stephen, yeah. Yes, yes, I do. So... Um, my my first question to you is Stephen. I've heard that you that you've um, trained at Watford Football Club. Now, um, how does a kind of footballer's training program compared to um, compared to a cricketer's training program? Obviously, the footballers obviously train in the summer, obviously, whilst you're obviously out playing, and obviously you guys obviously train in the winter, obviously when they play um, when they play during the summer. And the second um, question is. Um, obviously, with 100 coming up this year, you, I don't think, have been selected by any of the clubs um, or, the, or the franchise, should I say. Um, with the, with the um, people that have been selected, the other county players that have been selected, how do you think that they will get on? And do you think that the 100 will be a good thing kind of going forward in the next, say, maybe two, three years' time? Um, yeah, I. so I think football... Football is very different to cricket in the, the way that they need to be very fit to run around and, and run at high intensity for 90 minutes. And we need to be able to be slow, ploddy people who do stuff over the course of five days. Um, so that's that's very different. I, I trained there. I didn't actually train train. I did rehab there with one of oh, their physios um, for a few weeks because they have a special running machine. It's called an anti-gravity running machine where... Mm. I had a stress fracture in my foot and you can choose the percentage of your body weight that you put through your body whilst you're running on this special running machine. Um, so you get like hooked up into it and then you start at 10% and then go to 20%. So it feels like you're on the moon at the beginning and then you progress to a stage where you're at hundred percent of your body weight on your feet again. So um, Watford football club had one of those and they very kindly let me use that for my rehab um, one winter when I came home injured from a tour. Um, and then the second part of your question was just remind me what it was again. Sorry, it was, it was about um with about the hundred this year, and obviously with that's right. Players that have been selected, how do you think that they will get on? And do you think that this will be a thing going forward in say the next maybe two three years time? Obviously, with the launch of it this year. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the resources in this country have gone into that tournament now. I think so. Um, it has to run for a number of years, and I think that. 
Uh, it's an opportunity to get cricket onto terrestrial TV, which we've seen with this test match is a fantastic thing. I think, what was it, 1.1 million people a day watch the cricket, which is the yeah. highest numbers for a long time. So, um, so yeah, I think not having cricket behind a paywall is a good thing um, for engagement in the game. Um, you have to appreciate the fact that Sky have pretty much funded the game for the last 15 years um, and supported it and took it to the point that it is now. But um, yeah, having it on free to air TV is good. And, and I think that, yeah, the proposition of, I know that there's a lot of resistance among traditional cricket fans for um, the hunt not to be a thing and for it to fail. But I think that we all have a responsibility to buy into it because cricket as a game um, isn't, I don't think, that particularly well equipped to survive in modern life without adaptations to it. So, um, I can see Simon half grinning here at my answer um, because <laughs> I don't know what his views on it are. But yeah, I think the hundred something that's here to stay. So we have no choice but to buy into it. And I think that it could lead to exciting things once people get used to the format. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, and, and I think, sorry, sorry, sorry to have a follow up here, Simon, if you don't mind. But with the with the follow up of how, say, like the Big Bash is going and the IPL obviously is going in India, obviously that. You know, we will obviously we'll see see what it goes. But obviously, the ECB have obviously splashed obviously quite a lot of money into this. Um, do you kind of think that kind of with that? Um, do you think that maybe after after like the year has gone, will the ECB probably look at it and go right? We've put a lot of money into this. We we wasted probably nearly quite a lot of this, you know, on that whole one tournament. Or will actually think, oh, we've actually spent some good money here on this hundred tournament. Um, I've got no idea, to be honest. I, I don't. What, you, what do you think, Simon? Have you, you got any thoughts on that? Uh, uh, Has the BBC got any anything for it, Simon? Are the, are the BBC yeah. doing anything for that? Yeah, yeah, they're doing lots. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the BBC yeah, yeah. got about ten matches. Yeah. Uh, my honest answer to that is, like Stephen, actually, I, on, I don't know whether the hundred will be a success or not. I really don't. I really don't know. I mean, what, what makes a success? I suppose they've sold the TV rights for lots of money, and uh, Tom Harrison said, well, that's already made it a success. But it'll only be a success if people watch it on TV and if people go to the ground and watch it and are happy to go and watch it. If if no if you know if the crowds are small and the, and the viewing figures on TV are not great, then what they do, then they'll they'll have to move away from it. It'll be a success. It'll be a success if they get the best players and the players buy into it and play hard and the games are good. So the product is the product's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, yeah. And, and I think that from the players I've spoken to, they're quite excited by it. I mean, whether they'll be absolutely exhausted by the time we get there and haven't got anything left to give. And I've just looked at the schedule. I mean, England's schedule is horrendous. So how, how you know, the Stokeses and Arts and people like that are going to be able to play in it, I don't well, they won't, know. They won't play very much, will they? That's, they'll play a know, bit, but it's even that is going to be won't, hard. Yeah, they won't, yeah. they won't play very much. But, yeah, you're right. If the product's good, people watch it, and people yeah. watch it on TV and go to the grounds, and, yeah, but if they don't, then they, they've got a big problem. But Jack, they're, they're... Jack, Jack, one more question I think we got from the audience. Jack, are you here? And if you're not, I'll read it out. Um, i go for the read enough. enough. Are you here, Jack? Not said you should read it, Yards. Okay. Uh, well, no. I, I mean, well, his question is, what products do you put in your hair? <laughs> Nothing at the moment. It's lovely. <laughs> I'm, I've gone for the Simon Mann approach, short and <laughs> as little as possible. <laughs> Thanks very much. Right. Philly. Okay. Well, we can, well, thank you for that question, Jack. Um, hasn't really enlightened us massively. Um, anyway, I'd love to ask Stuart Broad and um, <laughs> Ben Stokes what they put in their hair. Um, some kind of special spray. Um, anyway, <laughs> right, it's quiz time. Finney, this is the last bit. It's the, it's the we, you, you've, you've reached the, the summit. Now you've got to, just below the summit, now you've got to get to the top, okay? I'll scale the peak, of I, okay? Yeah. So it's, it's called How Well Do You Know Yourself? It starts with some music. Not that one, yours. I'm glad you took, took a drink there because, yeah, you'll need some sustenance for this. Right, and if you get it right, the question, you get a... He's got it! And if you get it wrong, you get a... Fair enough. 
Now, who's he got to beat, Simon? Right, Can you well, remember? Yeah, 10 questions, Finney. And at the top of the tree is, uh, well, another Middles former Middlesex and England player. I say former. I don't put you down in the former England player uh, category yet. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, Straussy. Andrew Strauss, 9 out of 10. Live from Barbados about three or four weeks ago. He got 9 out of 10. Um, but we find that people get about seven or eight, some, so somewhere around that. Alistair Cook managed four before Christmas. So um, th th that's your, I suppose that's your first target. So these are all questions about uh, yourself, things you've achieved or bits and pieces about yourself. So you should, yep. in theory, you should, in theory, know the answer because you've done them all or been there to do them all. Uh, whether you can remember or not is another matter altogether. Okay, okay yours? Yeah, far away. First question then. Um, you've actually sort of touched on this already, this, this, this question. So this should be quite straightforward for you. We, norm we normally start off with a half body on leg stump. So question number one, you've taken 125 test wickets. Which of these batsmen did you not dismiss? MS Dhoni, Virat Kohli, Ricky Ponting, A.B. de Villiers, Dinesh Chandimal, Jack Callis or Kumar Sangakara. So, which one of those did you not dismiss? You dismissed uh, every one uh, but one. Yeah, I think Sangakara. I think thinking off the top of my head, I can't remember. I can remember the others. I think. He's got it. Well done. That's a a, a free ball at the stumps, an unprotected stumps. Well done. Okay. <laughs> question two. You're known as the Watford Wall. Because of your 56 of 203 balls against New Zealand in Dunedin, what is your second highest test score? Oh, Christ. Okay, this one's hard. I I think it was on the same tour. Are you going to give me clues? Are you going to nod to any of my clues? Or just... Maybe. See how you get on. I think it was on the same tour. Mm -hmm. And I think it was 25 at Wellington against New Zealand. He's got it! <laughs> we'll give you that actually very good is actually 24 but at wellington oh, okay. uh, correct oh. so yeah we'll give you that we'll yeah, be, we're in okay. a generous mood generous. Yeah, we, oh, we've, nice. had, we've given some uh, contestants some latitude on that i think 24 yeah next match in wellington yeah i think that's close enough right number three pretty bad actually really i mean 56 and then you, your next best is 24 i mean what well you know, yeah, one more funny story if this isn't holding things up too much that um, I got offered some money to have a back of the bat sponsor for the last test match on that tour because it seemed that I'd, I'd obviously turned the corner with my batting. I'd gone 56 and then 24 playing some flashy strokes. Um, and yeah, they put a sticker on my bat for the last test match and I got a pair. <laughs> but actually, you walking out and walking back, at least, you know, they seem they still get plenty of exposure. It's Close together as well. Not as much as you get if you're out there for 203 balls no, like he was in Dunedin. Uh, question number three. Uh, right, here we go. Here we go. It's another batting question, uh, Finney. Question number three. How many sixes have you hit in international cricket? I can, mm. give, you, I can give you a bit of a spread if you'd like. Unless you, unless you want to... Well, I obviously... Yeah, I, I will take the spread. I've got an idea in my head of how many it was. Okay, all right. It's between three and eight. Well, that's thrown me slightly. How many did you have? What were you going to say? I was going to say three because I think, I, I, yeah, I'm three, I think. Very good. He's got it! Yeah, the, spread was, the spread was a bit of a trick there. Uh, all in one. I can tell you where they are. Yeah, go on then. Um, I can tell you where they are. But you, it's better if you tell us. Um, it was Ravinda Jadeja um, in India. I can't remember exactly the ground. Hyderabad. Um, yeah, Hyderabad. Uh, Shane Watson on my ODI debut. And Fawad Ahmed at Old Trafford. Perfect. Yeah, mm. Brisbane, Brisbane, the first one. Old Trafford, Hyderabad. Excellent. Right. That's Very good. That three out of three. three, out three. Out three. Well. Now, this, this one's going to sort you out. Right? Okay, person four. <laughs> Who was the first and last player you dismissed in Test cricket? So who was your okay. first wicket and who was your last wicket, basically? Yep. Um, I am going to say that the first person I dismissed in Test cricket was Shahadat Hussain for Bangladesh. Um, and I'm going to say that the last person that I got out was Yasir Shah. 
Well, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you half a mark got, for that. Yeah, half a let mark. Let me see. Okay, let me have another think. No, I, it's a Pakistani at the Oval. It has to be one at the Oval. But yeah. I thought I nicked Yasser Shah off on the morning of one of the days. I can't, and I walked off injured that day with a tour quad. Well, so I can't well Simon, Simon Mann is not very, he's not renowned for the accuracy of his um, this, research. But this, this is not, calm is, this is is not true, Yoz. I only, got, I only got one question wrong, and that was to Joe Root, embarrassingly, in our first ever virtual cricket club. <laughs> And that was the only one I've got wrong so far in because I looked at the wrong column on the quick info. Anyway, so Hale Khan is the answer. Uh, we'll give you half a mark for that. Yeah, three, so and, three and a half, half three out of half, Yeah, so you, you could still beat Stracey. Question number five okay. On what ground did you produce your best T20 bowling figures for England? You took three for 16, but on what ground? <sighs> um, it's, it's against New Zealand. I'm going to say. I can't, it's in Sri Lanka. I know that. It was in the T20 World Cup in 2016. Uh, sorry, 2012. Um, I want to say Palakelli. He's got it! There we go. <laughs> Very good. There go. Impressive. Four and a half out of five. Wow. <clears throat> Question six. In which country do you have your best test bowling average? Hmm. Is that including the the including England? England? Yeah. Um, so, which where's your lowest average per wicket? I'm trying to think. Test cricket. I'm, um, I'm going to say England. You sure? Yeah, I can't. Like, I've done all right overseas, but I never did amazing overseas. I, yeah, I'm going to say England. Wrong. <laughs> South Africa, average twenty six. Is it really? South Africa. Yeah. Oh, there average we go. Twenty six. You go. You learn things on this show. That's right. Yeah. It's four I did and a half out of six. Tour as well. well it's not looking good, is it? Question number seven. Four and a half out of six. Who was your first Ashes victim? Um, Simon Cattage, caught and bowled. He's got it. Don't get extra marks for that. <clears throat> for saying caught and bold. Five and a half out of seven. Very good. Uh, question eight. What was your best season for Middlesex and how many wickets did you take? And if you don't get it exactly right, we'll let you off. Are you talking about um, number of wickets? Or yeah, kind of, yeah. Kind of number of wickets, really. Yeah. Uh, 2009, 53. No, that's wrong. Well, no, it's not. It's not yours. <laughs> oh, here we go. Well, I looked it up and it's because the best season is 2010 64. Yeah, but that's including test match wickets. You hmm. said for Middlesex. The question was okay. for Middlesex. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll give you that. He's got it. And you, I'll give you, I'll give you, you it. Can fair enough. You can fact check, you can fact check that on, that on Cricket Archive. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Well. I, I, that's okay. That's me put in my place after. Simon Mann's error in the first show. Right, <laughs> I got it wrong. Okay, so that's six and a half out of eight. Two right. questions to go. Yeah, number nine then. Who has a better first-class batting average? You, Stephen Finn, that is. Angus Fraser or Simon Hughes? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm going to hope, Yozzy. Yozzy, you could bat a bit, couldn't you? I thought you could bat a bit. I mean... <sighs> You know what's annoying? I think actually first class cricket, Gus has me covered. I've got him covered in tests, but I think he might. Um... I'm going to say Gus. It's me! <laughs> no, I was going to say. <laughs> what was you your know? average? 11.37. Gus was 11.19, you were 9.81. Yeah. I know, it's a travesty that I'm that. Do you know why it is? Because for the first three years when I was a kid and playing first-class cricket, someone had just bowled one short one at me, I'd drop my shopping all over the place and then they'd bowl full and straight and get me out. And that was, I was just a walking wicket for three years. That's what I blame it on. Mm. 
I'm actually quite proud of an average of 11.3. I mean, everyone says, oh, you don't know anything about batting. But I actually think, in, well, especially the era when there were so many fast bowlers around, I think 11.37 was quite good, actually. I'm amazed I got that many. Anyway, final question. So you're now on... Six and a half out of nine. Six and a half out of nine. So, yeah, you need to get this, really, um, to sort of have a respectable score. What do your colleagues say turns you from a sane 31-year-old into a spoilt, angry 10 year old child? I, I, well, I'm going to say it's something PlayStation related. Um, probably losing a game of FIFA. Oh, it's brilliant. That was a brilliant answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brilliant, that is top answer. And can you, can you expand on it? Why are you, um, why is there this rage when you lose at FIFA? Because I don't like being useless at something um and when you lose a game of online football to someone it makes you feel pretty useless at it so like any good professional sportsman i don't look inward i look outward and start blaming other things so that's what turns me into a petulant child well anyway um you rescued your your score a little bit there with that last question you started well faded in the middle and then came back at the end perhaps a bit like your you know a bit like your first class career or test career maybe anyway well done you got seven and a half out of ten that's that's a decent score I see Catherine Gobel was playing along with that as well. She got five out of ten on, on uh, five of those questions. And, and she, we never said she's the super fan, did we? We never said that, did we? Catherine, is that true? You're the super fan, aren't you? Well, Finney's super fan. Yeah, Finney's right, super fan. Okay. Okay. Well, well nice well to done. meet you. Well done, Catherine. Excellent. Okay, well, we're done, I think, pretty much, aren't yeah. we, uh, yeah. Simon? Um, yeah. I suppose um, we could just, uh, you know, forecast for the next test. What, what's your, what, what, what side would you pick for England and, you know, how's it going to go, do you think? Oh, it's tricky, isn't it, now? Because folks obviously comes in for Butler. Um, Archer's been ruled out with his elbow injury. So I think it's a question of whether... I have a feeling that India may prepare something that spins from very early in the game. So it doesn't give England an opportunity to get a huge first inning score. Um, so I think that Moen Ali might end up playing as um, as a third spinning option instead of Jofra. Um, I, I don't know quite know how you'd balance the team around that, um, but I think we might see another spinner from England, especially if India do look at it and go, we need to win two out of the last, or they need to win the series basically to get into the World Championship final. So... Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if we don't see something that's quite as favourable for batting on the first couple of days. But will that play into the reverse swingers' hands again? Yeah, I don't think you can underestimate how strong England's ability to bowl with reverse swing is. Yeah, so anytime a wicket's dry and um, and spins, it obviously gives the ball enough opportunity to rough up and be potent for reverse swing as well. So it's going to be a fine balance between whether they um, whether they feel like they want the extra seamer for that reason or whether they want the spinner to really try and attack with spin. And somebody tweeted today, 56 days to the new county season. So how do you see it? Uh, Middlesex, who've been you know, 2016 champions and then rather disappointing really for a few years. So how do you see this season and how can you get up again? Uh, well, I think the change in the structure has given us an opportunity to get up again because we can actually win the championship, even though we were in division two, um, we or should have been in division two if it would have gone back to a divisional structure. So uh, that that's a good start. I think that we're a team with very exciting young group of players. I think that after we won the championship, we didn't evolve as we should have done. People evolved around us um, and got better. And that's the reason why we were in that relegation fight um, that ended up not going our way that season. And then since that time, there's been changeover of personnel. Um, we've had to almost rebuild from the bottom um, and start again and try and build a team that can be competitive. So, and I think that we're very much on the way to doing that. There were signs last summer that we were doing that. Um, and, and I think that we can build on those again. So, um, and I'm hoping that me being fit and firing and, and you know, 
again, it's only indoor nets, but this is as good as I've felt bowling wise for a number of years now since the knee surgery. So, um, and the positions that I'm getting in. So hopefully I can have a part to play in that. And there's a lot of determined guys to prove that, um, that, that we are still one of the best teams around. Oh, good to hear. Excellent. Yeah. Well, great. All the best with the fitness, uh, Finney, and getting into, you know, the pre-season training and getting into the new season. Um, uh, Absolutely. Finney, yeah. We, we, Finney was walk, working with us on, uh, on the Big Bash uh, during the winter. Um, I hope to see you soon uh, next to me in the commentary box. And, yeah, you know, all, I always enjoy it. Let's, let's, let's get that CX up where it belongs. <laughs> yeah, we'll get another county championship flag for you. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, listen, great. Good luck with it all. And no, thanks, guys. And good thanks luck with the podcast me. as well. And we'll, we'll keep you reminded if, if you know, if, you, if your standards slip, <laughs> make sure the sound quality is good. And yeah, I've bought my own bought my microphone. Yeah, so good. good. That's good, actually. That's good. What's it called again? Just give it give it a quick plug. It's called Zero Ducks Given. Zero Ducks. It's given. a it's a look at the current cricketing things that are going on in the world, and then some just stories and and other stuff to chat about. Really. So yeah, it's not not entirely serious the whole time, but we have a good look at what's going on and then talk about other stuff as well you must struggle to get a word in with dan actually though do they do they actually does he actually let you speak that's why mute is brilliant on zoom isn't it he's just <laughs> mute <laughs> great well, stuff, i'm sure it? you've got a few uh, <laughs> a few listeners here tonight who will who, yeah. be joining in but you've got to keep them interested mm. otherwise they'll they'll drop we, off we try our best Yours, <laughs> we try our best <laughs> great well listen we'll let you go and have your dinner or cool. whatever maybe rehearse your next show and Many thanks for joining uh, and thank you to everyone as well who's been on the show tonight and keep supporting us. Keep talking to your friends and telling the, your friends about it. Ian Smith next week, direct from New Zealand. So uh, looking forward to that. Meantime, Stephen Finn, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you very much and good night. Cheers, guys. Thanks for having me.